Good evening. This is Patrick D. McCoy, the African-American voice of classical music, and I want to welcome you to this very special installment of the Opera Diva series. As many of you know, we have uh, profiled several of the world's leading opera singers on this series, and today we are honored to be joined by soprano Othony Graham, gaining acclaim for her interpretation of various operatic roles, Graham has garnered exceptional praise from audiences and critics alike. As Turidot, timbre and power were thrilling, stealing ring from top to bottom, and her path from imperiousness to passion was convincing, said the Boston Globe. Most recently, she was heard at National Opera and also in Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center. Now, of course, I can go on and on and on about opera's many accomplishments, but enough about me talking. I want to hear her talk to her audiences now as we welcome soprano Opheli Graham to the Opera Diva Series. Good evening, Opheli. Good evening. I'm so thrilled to be with you. Oh, Such an honor goodness. for me. <laughs> <laughs> and as you all can tell, you know, I usually say Ms. Graham, but Opley is a friend, so it's an honor to welcome Opley, uh to the series. Now, Opley, you're there in Atlanta, Georgia. Tell me about your trip and what takes you to Atlanta. I am in Atlanta. I just arrived uh, this afternoon, late this afternoon, where I will be singing with the Atlanta Symphony my very first, believe it or not, uh, Verdi Requiem. Oh, my word. My very first one. Thank you. I'm very excited. I was sort of on tender hooks with everyone else waiting for Atlanta, you know, to settle their negotiations and contract issues. And I'm so thrilled that they did so that I would have the opportunity to make my debut. And this Verdi Requiem is called the Defiant Requiem. Uh, mm-hmm. So it really holds a special place in my heart as well as the hearts of a lot of people. Well, Defiant, that's an interesting title. Tell me a little bit about this this setting of of the Requiem. What makes it so special? The Defiant Requiem um, was done uh, in one of the concentration camps during World War II. There were some singers who learned the Requiem uh, by rote, basically, and they performed the Verdi Requiem 16 times, which I think is just astonishing. Mm. Um, You know, in a statement of defiance, against their captors. What they wanted to do, uh, essentially, was answer the worst uh, of humankind with the best of mankind, which was Verdi's beautiful music. Mm. That is that is spectacular. Um, it, it really is, and it's, it's such a wonderful way to do it. There's going to be a full performance of the Verdi Requiem as it was written, and it includes videos and, and, you know, testimonials from surviving members who actually were in the chorus who sang, you know, all 16 of those performances. Mm. Now, I understand you're doing the Verdi Requiem, and for most people, the Verdi Requiem is a powerful work, it's a sacred work, but it's also a concert work. Um, what kind of emotional, I guess, preparation you have to have? I mean, it's, it's not just the Verdi Requiem, as you mentioned, they sing it sing this particular version during the concentration uh, camps. What do you think that will do to you on the stage? How how you prepare oh, for that kind of emotion? I think, you know, tomorrow is our first rehearsal, so we're going to have a wonderful opportunity um, to speak with the conductor. Um, and, you know, he this sort of, I believe, from what I'm understanding, was his baby to bring this to the world so that everyone can see. A lot of people don't know this story. And they don't know the story of all of the artists that came out of this camp. Um, so for us, it's a wonderful opportunity to see, you know, some of the the actual surviving singers. I mean, to, to meet anyone who was not only in a concentration camp, but who was defiant and, and had the inner fortitude to actually stand and, and sing and answer such ugliness with such beautiful music, I think is just awe-inspiring. I think it's really going to lift all of us up. Mm, oh, my word. That's just so spectacular. Now, just moving a little bit, uh, backtrack a little bit. Um, the last time um, I heard you was here in Washington, D.C., and you've certainly uh, become a favorite here in this area, uh, performing several times with the Washington Chorus, and most recently it was in the uh, – the Wagner, all blowout Wagner at the Kennedy Center. But tell me about um, your interaction with the late Evelyn Lear, who just not too long ago passed. 
Oh, I loved her so much. You know, it's funny. When I came to the, the Wagner Society of Washington, um, Evelyn and I did not sing, if I can you know, call her by her first name. Uh, she and I did not sing the same repertoire, but, you know, of course, she knew so much about singing and music. When I started to coach some things with her, it was always things that she didn't sing, and she was always uh, very strong and aggressive, but still very loving with me. And what I got from working with her more was not just about singing, but about the business and about being a woman in the business and being able to, you know, sort of tie a a knot at the end of a rope and just hang on for dear life sometimes. You know, she really was along at a time when there was an arena of incredible singers, you know, Kalas and and Zinka Milanoff. And I mean, she was in an era where the world was filled with amazing singers and she was able to create this incredible niche for herself mm. and and really you know with her incredible gift with her incredible looks her incredible voice her incredible figure but also with her inner fortitude that she had in spades that I really admired the one reason I spent as much time as I did with her a lot of it was you know us just sitting on the couch talking or having lunch or you know if something happened you know, in, in my career or I had a question, I would often call her for advice just because she was so incredibly uh, strong and helped me to to be even stronger than I already am. That is phenomenal. Um, just in terms of talking about image uh, as, it, as it pertains to women in the business of opera, a lot of times uh, women are held to a, a different kind of standard uh, that men as it uh, pertains to appearance. Would you maybe talk to me about your journey, uh, as many have, have gone on uh, this journey as well, uh, about uh, maybe weight loss and how uh, weight loss has maybe affected your career in both positive and, and negative ways? Well, I think, you know, uh, anyone who doesn't believe that the world of opera has changed is is uh, completely wrong. I mean, it, it's not – it always was a visual art form, you know, mm-hmm. Um, and regardless of what we would like it to be, it's show business. And in order to be in show business, you know, we have to be in the best physical shape we possibly can. And, you know, for those of us who love to eat, (laughs) it's a little harder (laughs) than others. Um, But it was really hit home for me, you know, while I was still at school at the Academy of Vocal Arts. And, you know, they really said it's very important uh, that your physicality matches your vocalism. So mm-hmm. my old close to 400-pound body certainly did not go with my voice and my package, quote, unquote. You know, regardless of how uh, agile I was at the time and, and still am, you know, when you walk into a rehearsal, a, a director does not know that you're physically agile, that you're able to run on the stage or lie down on the stage and and jump up and run over here, run over there. And I think that as opposed to focusing on being thin, that we need to focus just on physical strength for all of the traveling, for all of the rehearsals, and being uh, physically able to do what we want as actors and actresses. Uh, our characters to be able to do. That is certain some food for thought. So if there are some listeners out there who are <laughs> dealing with this particular issue, are you like We are fun? all dealing with the issue. You're <laughs> sitting in a hotel room, you know, dealing with the issue. You come home late from rehearsals and, you know, you always want to make good food choices and you don't want to be out, you know, eating late at night with your cast. It's It's very difficult. But I think that the idea, as opposed to us only focusing on a size, or you know, because we all come in different shapes and sizes, and I know for certain that this is a battle that I'm obviously winning, but that I will struggle with for the rest of my life. But my main focus is being able to, you know, remain as healthy as humanly possible, and you know, be physically uh, easy on the eyes <laughs> if I can be, <laughs> and uh, and to make myself, you know, stay in the kind of shape that I'm in now, where I can you know, run if I want to or, you know, lay down on the stage and sing if I want to. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be thin. I'm perfectly 
happy, and I'm sure there are other people that are perfectly happy with my extremely curvy body. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to work right. for the women that I play on stage, that's for sure. <laughs> Now, this is certainly a big year for you. Uh, next month, you will sing your first international tour. And uh, talk to me a little bit about that. And how does that make you feel? How exciting? Oh, it's so exciting. You know, Turandot has been such a gift to me. She is such a wonderful role. And I really hope that I will have, you know, a, a ton of them on the horizon. Um, it's a relatively short role, but definitely uh, one that is taxing but exciting. She's a wonderful character. And for me to have my first international one, to go to Mexico uh, and to sing her is just thrilling beyond measure. That is wonderful. Are you ready to do, to just to woo the audiences there in Mexico? Well, tell me a little bit about the, uh, are you free with the, uh, the hall or the, the company that you're singing with? Uh, I'm singing with the uh, Opera du Nuevo Leon, and uh, I know it's in Monterey, so it's going to be gorgeous. Uh, from the photos, it looks gorgeous. Um, <laughs> it's a very international cast, from what I understand. Uh, so it'll be wonderful. And I, I'm excited to work with other people and to see, and other conductors, especially European conductors as well, to see what their take on the characters are. I mean, I've worked with such incredible conductors already on Turandot. You know, I worked with Jim Mina in Arizona, who I thought was just uh, such an incredible conductor and never brought a <laughs> score to rehearsal. Just oh, conducted wow. from every rehearsal from memory, which I thought was thrilling and daunting for all of us. Um, but to work with different directors also, to see what their their take on the play is, their take on the the character and how we can bring that together in Mexico. I mean, what a better place to do it. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be oh. lots of fun. And I'll definitely be, have to be watching my diet out there. I'll tell you that. Oh, my goodness. Now, we talked a lot about your singing. Uh, but let's travel back in time uh, to your childhood. Did you see yourself being a singer? You know, when people have these pipe dreams, they say, when I grow up, I want to be a doctor. I want to be this or that. Was singing the first thing? And if not, what did you plan on doing? I... Definitely did not play. I thought I would sing in some capacity. You know, I took some lessons when I was a teenager. But I always thought that I would be a news anchor. Oh, wow. Believe it or not. I I had a little local uh, television show on our local news station, our little small local news station uh, in Etobicoke, Focus on Etobicoke it was called. And I used to anchor. I lied about my age to get the job. I guess they must know now. Uh, I was 16 at the time and, you know, put on my best fake Barbara Walters look and uh, went in. And my father drove me and I got the little volunteer. I mean, it was a volunteer job, but I was beside myself. And I was so ambitious that I branched off into doing a little talk show, a phone in talk show. And I had little guests. My first subject was abortion or elder abuse or something big and controversial. And there was my 16-year-old self looking as serious as possible and covering up my pimples on camera. <laughs> wow. Yes. You should put some of those I, videos on YouTube. Uh, there, my, it's funny. My, my mother just dug them up. My father used to drop me off at the station and then rush home to tape the show. <laughs> so I, I certainly have a few of those VHS tapes, you know, lying around, that's for sure. But I had every intention of going to um, a school, a university in Toronto for, um, you know, television arts. That was my, my whole thing. And I didn't get in. I had wow. the editor of my little show, who was you know, an older woman. She was fantastic. I had her put together a little tape for my audition and, uh, you know, a big compilation of my show with, you know, outtakes and funny things and all that. I mean, I literally thought that I was a shoe in So when I got home that one day and the letter came back from the university that I will not mention, although if they gave me an honorary doctorate, it would be wonderful, um, <laughs> <laughs> just to make up for it. Um, when the letter came saying that I did not get in, I was devastated. 
and that was it. I never, I never went back to the, ri- I never went back to the TV station. Nothing. Devastating. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, and after that, I focused on singing. Well, I guess we ought to be glad that, you know, they rejected you as that you're <laughs> singing because we are so richer for it. So, almost thank you. Thank you for rejecting Awfully Graham. <laughs> thank you for rejecting Awfully Graham. Isn't that terrible? Rejecting. <laughs> It is, and I was so know. I was so smarting from the rejection. I couldn't even go back to my little job that I loved so much. I figured I must be terrible at it if I was rejected. <laughs> and you would think, you know, now of course I would have gone and applied at you know every other university for you know some sort of media arts degree of some sort. But I was so devastated and thought for sure that I was terrible. I just gave up. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you did not give up in so many ways because now you get to grace many of the international stages of opera, and we are just looking forward to being those performances. But, but before I go any further, I want to bring the listeners' attention, especially if you're in Atlanta, that if you would uh, join us as we support, of course, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, but by all means support uh, soprano Opera Graham as she makes her debut with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra on Thursday, October 11th at 8 o'clock p.m. in the Defiant Requiem, which should be a wonderful uh, experience. And just as we um, bring our interview to a close on the Opera Diva series, Opley, thank you so much definitely for being here with us and, and sharing with us your career journey. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so thrilled and honored because I have always listened to your show and I've heard some of my incredible colleagues and other singers that I've admired so much and other musicians. So it was a thrill for me. Oh, my goodness. You're too kind. Before we leave, though, I want, you know, every time that there is a great person or someone doing something great out front, there's always people, there are always people behind the scenes supporting, nurturing, and just steering them in the right uh, direction. And I understand your management company is phenomenal. Talk to us a little bit about Uzan International Artists. Oh, they're fantastic. They are, uh, I'm new on the roster. Uh, I left my other management and moved to them. And they are just really, really, really good. It's a, it's a smaller agency with a roster of incredible singers. And all of the singers work incredibly hard. The agents work incredibly hard. But they have a lot of international, which I need, of course, the most, uh, European connections. Um, and they're able to help their singers, but also to advise them about repertoire uh, and have a more hands-on approach, which I think every singer needs at every facet of their career. You know, um, that's a, I'm glad that we, we touched about the management piece because a lot of people approach uh, me and ask about management companies, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I think this might be a little more so of, of information for someone on the, on the cusp of a, a professional career. What is... What are maybe one or two things that one should look for when they're picking uh, a company to manage their career? Well, I think, I mean, first of all, I think that a lot of the times the manager chooses you. I mean, in order to be a managed singer, you have to have something to manage. You know, that, <laughs> that I think is the most, that is, whenever, whenever singers ask me, you know, that, not that I'm in any position to give a lot of advice, but the one thing that I have to say is that you have to have, you know, some sense of yourself and a sense of, I have a package, not just a voice, but I have a package that can be marketed. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I have, whether it's a a rough around the edges package, that doesn't matter. It doesn't necessarily have to be a completely finished product. But, you know, Bernardo Zahn has been in the business of singing, oh my gosh, you know, for over 30, 40 years. You know, his wife was was one of the leading sopranos of all time. Um, so, and and to have you know his daughter is there and and some great associates, Dana, and uh, they're just they're incredible. But as a singer, it's really important, I think, that you have a good relationship with your management. But before you think about management, you have to know that you have something to manage. Mm, now that is definitely a food for thought. <laughs> you have to have you have to know that you have something to manage. Just very quickly, Alpha, I want to bring the listeners attention to where they can find more information um on you and your career and certainly follow your career. We're certainly ecstatic about 
of your career, especially this first international trend out, which is major news. So, yes. of course, uh, <laughs> and hopefully will lead to many, 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 many more turnouts all over the world. Yay. And it <laughs> shall. Um, if you want to know more about Offaly Graham's career, I invite you to visit www.offalygramsoprano.com. That's all together. Of course, if you're members of the media and you want more information as far as press releases and things of that uh, nature, including interview requests, uh, those are directed to HKS PR Arts at hks.prarts at gmail.com. And of course, as we mentioned, Ms. Graham's uh, management company is Uzan International Artists uh, located in New York, and um, I have that information posted. Again, we have been speaking to soprano Ophelia Graham, Canadian American soprano Ophelia Graham, about her wonderful career, and we certainly celebrate the fact that she's making uh, her debut. Uh, with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and also her first international tour. That's so awfully a gig. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. I, it was such a thrill to speak to you and to everyone <laughs> who has been asking for this interview. I'm thrilled that I had an opportunity to do it, and I'm especially thrilled that I got to do it here in Atlanta. Thank you so much. Awfully have a great evening, and again, bravo and congratulations. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Again, we have been speaking with Canadian-American soprano Ophelia Graham, who makes her debut with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra in the Tourettesen, uh, read the Defiant Requiem, rather, at Tourettesen, uh, my Verdi. And we also celebrate her triumph, her her recent um, fact that she'll be making her first uh, international, doing her first international um, tour and in Mexico. Again, this is again been Patrick McCoy, the African American voice in classical music on the Opera Diva series with Canadian American soprano Ophelia Graham. We do invite you to follow the show on Facebook at Patrick D. McCoy, the African American voice in classical music. You may also follow me on Twitter at Patrick D. McCoy. And also, if you want to, you can just go ahead and look me up on the web, PatrickDMcCoy.com. Again, this is Patrick D. McCoy the African-American voice and classic music, and I wish you all a wonderful evening.